Okay, we're just setting that up. Okay, Holly, you're fine to go now. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Nikki. Uh, hello and good evening, everybody, virtually. Um, yeah, so uh, I thought we'd start with a fun, a fun photograph of, uh, of a family having fun on the beach. Um, so today uh, my talk is going to cover, let's see if it behaves, there we go, perfect, um, is going to cover a range of, uh, a range of aspects of uh, seaside holidays in the past, uh, general history, getting to the seaside, beach attire, which includes the excellent swimwear photos we have, um, seaside activities, and finally the trusted requirement of any holiday in the past, a postcard home uh, or to a friend or family etc. So let's start from the beginning uh, featuring a lovely uh, couple of ladies who've got their pram rather stuck in the beach at Bantham. Um, so this talk is mainly going to focus on the 19th 21st century um, but for the history of seaside holidays we have to go back a little bit earlier to start with. Um, so we're going back quite a long way and slightly out of our area um, people have been interested in the health benefits of bathing um, for quite a long time, stemming from the popularity of spa bathing in the 1700s. In 1702, Sir John Floyer published the first edition of his History of Cold Bathing, in which he advocated sea bathing as a cure for many diseases. About 40 years later, Dr Richard Russell's dissertation on the use of seawater in the diseases of the glands um, was, is seen as a pivotal uh, point in people's interest in the sea as a source of health, which is where seaside holidays stem from. In the 1750s, we start to see the first seaside resorts in South Devon, although again, as you can see from this lovely uh, illustration, um, that tended to be around Timmouth and Dawlish area. Um, it was a very difficult place to get to at the time, um, and many resorts made extravagant claims about the health healing properties of their resorts. Um, Timoth in 1762 reported that numbers of people from all parts resort here in the summer season and cripples frequently recover the use of their limbs, hysterical ladies their spirits and even the lepers are cleansed. Later on the winter season allowed invalids and others who were recommended the sea air for their health um, began, to come to, began to come to these resorts in, the, in South Devon, particularly places like Tor Torquay and Torbay um, and that's what kept them sustained. Devon was fairly prosperous due to the woolen trade and Exeter was a hub for this. Due to the distance from London, the resorts were mainly populated by locals. Um, and while other resorts struggled um, following wars in the wool trade later on, um, Torquay really grew um, due to its winter season. It attracted gentle visitors seeking good company rather than just invalids going for the health reasons. Uh, this is a lovely photograph of the Borlase family of Coombe Royal having a lovely beach picnic, including a nun. From 1844 to 1900, the railway and the arrival of the railway in South Devon brought many more visitors to this area. This was the age that more middle and working class people could afford a holiday to the seaside. The Bank Holiday Act of 1871 gave workers Easter, Easter Monday, Whit Sunday and August Bank holidays off. The railway came to Kingsbridge in 1893, and this photograph shows a group of, um, of people, including a mine manager from the Nottinghamshire area, on holiday in the South Hams. Resorts in the South Hams, such as Solcombe, came about by those looking for something a little different from the larger resorts. These resorts were adapted from the existing economies, starting with little new building, and then the occasional hotel or similar being built later on. This lovely colour postcard is Sunny Cove, East Portermouth. And if you look closely on the beach, you'll see adorable little bathing huts, which I'll touch on later. Dartmouth was later in developing a tourist trade. Its rocky coastline was not as a deal for bathers and access to Dartmouth by land was difficult. The railway line from Paynton was due to go all the way to Dartmouth with a bridge across the river. But opposition from a local landowner meant that when the railway opened in 1864, it ended in Kingswear. And by 1900, it only had two hotels. People who really wanted quiet places, South Devon was for them. Torcross had few regular visitors who loved its peaceful atmosphere and its virtually deserted Three Mile Beach. Hope Cove had a sandy beach, small fishing village and was an artist's paradise. Lodgings were at the Anchor Inn and in private houses. 
Bantham was similar, but they were far from the nearest railhead. These smaller resorts only really opened up once motor cars arrived. Thurston Hotel opened in 1896 and catered for visiting golfers to the new, newly opened golf course. And this photograph shows the hotel in 1936. For the 1920s, resorts in the Southlands grew with more hotels, guest houses and activities for both visitors and locals to enjoy. The smaller res resorts continued to attract visitors seeking something slightly quieter than the traditional resorts, um, places like Torquay that have seen real decline since the arrival of package holidays in the 1960s. Sam will talk more about tourism today, uh, but we at the museum continue to collect material relating to holidays and tourism in this area. Small hotels, campsites, local accommodation, hire groups like Toad Hall and Coast and Country Cottages and the rise of sites like Airbnb mean the South Hams remain a popular destination to this day. That photograph is my friends <laughs> having a beach picnic in about 2014. Um, just an example. Right, the important bit. How you get to and from the beach. Transport had a real impact on the growth of the South Hams. South Devon resorts were seriously hampered by the road network. Highways were deeply rutted by heavy coaches and wagons, and not a single road in Devon was turnpiked before 1753, and even after that point, it still took a very long time before the main highways were widened and improved. Some would argue they're still pretty narrow. Um, roads to the coast were, and still are, very little more than tracks, and they were quite inadequate to cope with tourist traffic. Um, this lovely photograph shows uh, a horse and cart with a family, we think the Luscans, um, on their way to the beach in about 1920, I think. Um, one of my favourite photographs um, shows uh, a large group of men, women and children in their best clothes on South Sands Beach. If you look behind them, you'll see the paddle steamer Salcombe Castle moored behind. By the late 19th century, pleasure steamers were picking up passengers from all the principal resorts in South Devon. Pleasure was replacing improvement as health as a principal objective when visiting South Devon seaside locations. Sharabanks are an amazing uh, contraption, somewhere between a bus and a car, um, open top motor coaches or sometimes horse drawn vehicles that enable groups to get about. They were popular in the early 20th century. This photograph shows a group on a motor tour to Dartmoor from Salcombe and, Sal and Slapton Sands um, and was taken from a really great book, um, 400 Years in Torcross by Robin Rose Price and Claire Pauley. Um, and we have a copy of that in our archive. And that photograph was taken in 1928. Spot everybody wearing snazzy hats. The railway, as mentioned before, was the biggest impact on bringing tourists and visitors to this area. Um, as mentioned before, the poor roads, um, rail offered a quicker and easier way for visitors to get to more remote locations through Kingsbridge branch and also the paint and Kingswear line. The Kingswick branch suffered problems with stops and starts before eventually opening quite late in 1893. Um, and this photograph shows a very busy station um, in about 1910. Uh, the railway ran until 1961 when it was axed as part of the beach and cut. By this point, road transport had improved, so holidaymakers were still able to come to the region, although obviously not from the same methods as they could have done before. The motor car has had the biggest impact on resorts in this area. With improved road transports and improved road networks, more people were able to reach areas and continue to come every year. Satnavs has enabled people to bypass some of those routes and open up different routes and access, uh, as well as causing some jams occasionally. Um, and here's a more wonderful photograph of uh, Kingsbridge on the roundabout in the quay in about 2009. Right. The best bit about going to the seaside swimwear. Um, so this is a look at how beachwear has changed over the years. Um, this photograph uh, was taken in about 1920 and shows uh, a selection of ladies and kids uh, having fun, shall we say, um, in the sea. So from the beginning. In the 1700s, men traditionally bathed naked. Women sometimes bathed naked or wore only flimsy dresses for their dip. Even up until 1870, and after, men often bathe in the nude. Public decency was a real issue for Victorian England and segregated bathing was often enforced. By the end of the Victorian period, mixed bathing occurred once men were persuaded to put some clothes on uh, and the rise of resorts in France and Belgium where um, men and women could mingle. 
In Paynton, mixed bathing was permitted in 1897. This got plenty of media attention and an influx of visitors. Though only properly attired men and boys could mix with the ladies in the mixed bathing zone. Bathing machines, as seen in the far left of this photograph, made an early appearances in Devon. They were introduced to preserve modesty of bathers while changing and getting into the sea. These sheds on wheels, which is pretty much what they look like, uh, were pulled along by horses or bathing assistants or attendants. Bathers would have been dipped in the sea by attendants, which would not have been a fun experience, especially not later on in the year. Um, and this photograph was taken in 19, about 1920 um, and shows the Torcross Hotel in the background. So, in the early 1900s, cotton or wool bathing suits, there were either dresses worn over bloomers or one piece suits. They were often accessorized with stocking, bathing slippers and fancy caps. Men wore pieces thinner to long johns. So you can see the long johns in the right of the picture um, and the ladies in their bathing outfits. Um, the photograph on the left was taken actually in the estuary, um, just off Colopit Creek. And the photograph on the right is uh, Sulcombe, 1914. By the 1920s, the fashion for being active at the beach led to more fitted costumes. There was still a one piece, but more fitted and woolen costumes were commonplace. So we've got a selection of outfits here. As you can see from the one on the far left, the main challenge with woolen bathing costumes is once wet, they do tend to sag somewhat, um, which presents its own challenges. Um, so the lovely uh, photographs show photos from about 1945, group of ladies um, on the beach, not quite sure where. One of them is at Lanarkham um, and the other one at Thelston Beach. In the 1940s, woolen finally went out of favour and cotton costumes were used. The bikini arrived in 1946, though it wasn't common until Devon until later on. Ruched costumes were popular, especially for children, which you can see in the top left photograph um, of lovely Catherine Johns holding some seaweed on, on Lanarkham. Um, and the bottom right photograph um, is taken from the war years and shows a group of ladies at Hope Cove. Um, and two pieces start to turn up, which you can see in this there. And that was partly to do with clothing shortages in the war. Right. By the 1960s, bikinis were an accepted swimwear attire, though not the only outfit worn when swimming. Advances in technology gave rise to fitted one pieces and a range of colors and styles. The photograph on the left is a bit rather fuzzy, um, but it shows a swimming costume in our collection in use. Um, this is Doreen Hadlow um, on holiday in Lyme Regis, of all places. And there's a photograph on the right of the costume in our 2016 exhibition, all about the seaside. Um, the lovely photograph in the middle shows very fetching bathing trunks um, from members of the Gross family related to the Thurston Hotel um, and a really gorgeous swimsuit on the right as well. It's just a nice example of the evolution and development of swimming wear. By the 1970s, more technological advances and inbuilt support arrive. The rise of surfer fashion has a huge bearing on beachwear and also the dangers of the sun. So you start to see cover-ups for children and then for adults and also technological advances um, for improved support um, and comfort while swimming and activities in the water. And um, both these photographs were taken from our exhibition and showcase a selection of items that we hold and also that were loaned to us from Tonis Fashion Museum. If you're not swimming, you still need to wear something, well, I would say comfortable for the beach, but in this case, they don't look that comfortable. Um, so outfits to swimming, as well as swimming, outfits obviously to the beach have changed. In the 1900s, people traditionally wore their best outfits, which you can see bottom right. Um, Outfits are now designed for more practical beach wear and more comfortable. So you can see the kind of evolution of beach wear within these photographs. And also both photographs on the left show the advantage of continued enjoyment of ice lollies and ice creams while on the beach. So that's swimwear and how that's changed. Now we come to look at activities and things that people do on the beach and how that's changed. Um, this wonderful photograph, um, uh, was taken by Alex Williams and is a photograph of local surfer Ben Howie. Um, he's wearing a full wetsuit, but also that was taken in November 2015. So that's understandable. The beaches are now popular with surfers who've been surfing in these parts from about the 1960s. 
Um, another popular activity is stand up paddle boarding, um, which can be done on the estuary and at the coast. Recommended as a good activity to keep you fit and healthy and also a chance to see the area for a different view. Walking has been popular in this area for a long time and the southwest coastal path now attracts a wide range of people, including keen walkers. Uh, so these postcards show uh, walking of the cliff at Sharpeter and a group of walkers on Bulbury Down. Uh, note the snazzy leggings and attire on the walkers on the right um, and that they're all walking in their beautiful hats, which is really nice. Uh, fishing, many resorts in this area started off as fishing villages and many like Hope Cove and Bee Stands still have fishermen making their living today. Um, sea fishing was also a popular activity for visitors um, and Tor Cross remains popular with um, amateur fishermen and crabbing is another popular fun activity on the quay in Dartmouth, Salcombe and Kingsbridge. Um, this entry reads fishing group taken at East Portermouth. They've got quite a good catch there. Another iconic part of this region is the sea tractor, or in this case, sea bus. Uh, there are several in this area, including the one that runs at South Sands and the one photographed here, running between, uh, running it to and from Burr Island. Um, there have been sea tractors in use in this area since the 1930s. Um, and the water bus here was designed and built at Oaks Garage in Kingsbridge. Um, I'll just show you the close up of it. There, well, you can see the uh, the tidal path obviously um, offers opportunity for people to walk over to the island or catch the sea tractor if the tide is not suitable. <laughs> One of my favourite photographs in our collection features Robin Rose Price performing a water sea trick um, off at Tor Cross. Um, this area contains a lot of water sports activities, including uh, and particularly in this area, famous for sailing and regattas. Salcombe and Dartmouth both have regattas. Salcombe Sailing Club was founded in 1894 and holding regattas by 1899. There were big events by the 1920s, as these photographs show. This is particularly impressive if you look and realize that most of those people are standing on small boats <laughs> to have a good view of the activities and the event. And these photographs were taken by local photographer A.E. Fairweather. Dartmouth and the Gratta is earlier, with the first recorded regatta in 1822, with it being formally established in 1834, and both continue to host annual regattas, mostly today, and sailing and rowing are also popular sea time pastimes. Um, as mentioned earlier, mixed bathing <laughs> became a real thing and swimming is still a hugely popular thing to do all year round with inventions like wetsuits um, or people being very brave and dipping in without. Um, other activities include frisbee, balls, kite flying, and in the case of this photograph, my friends playing beach cricket in 2015. And finally, the most important part of any beach activity, the picnic. Um, this family, as you can see, have taken their full china with them to the beach and are wearing their nicest outfits. Um, although nowadays, uh, the invention of different materials um, has enabled us to have barbecues and activities without lugging china to the beach. All right, final bit of my talk covering what you do when you get to the beach and want to send your memories home. Uh, Emanuel Hermann first created postcards in Austria in 1869. In Britain, only the Royal Mail was allowed to publish postcards, but by 1894, private publishers were given permission to manufacture and sell picture postcards. Early picture postcards include famous landmarks, scenic views, photographs, lighthouses, animals, and drawings of celebrities. In 1902, Britain became the first country to divide the back of a postcard, a land display of a complete picture like this one in front of the cart. One of the most famous views of this area, uh, Thelston Rock. The time before the outbreak of World War, World War I in 1914 is widely considered to be the golden age of British postcards. So telephones had not been largely available and this was the main method of communicating. We have a large collection of postcards in our collection, which as well as covering sunny scenes is churches, random views of villages, all sorts of bits and pieces. It was the main way you communicated and post was very efficient. So you could send a, a message to say, I'm coming for tea this afternoon and it would arrive before you. Due to the atrocities of the, of the First World War, the buying and sending of postcards never reached the height of popularity it enjoyed pre-war. Instead, the picture postcard came to symbolise the seaside holiday. 
the use of postcards started to decline in the 1960s, thanks to the advance of technology, phones, and then mobile phones, and a range of other bits and pieces meant people didn't feel the need to send postcards anymore. But they continue to be a part of British social history, and modern postcards often show multiple views of places in good weather, like Sulcombe in this photograph, um, and are a good reminder of holidays uh, gone by too. That is me right up to date, hopefully, with a whistle stop tour uh, through the history of the seaside, seaside resorts, what people wore to the beach, how they got there, what they did, and postcards. And obviously, if you've got any questions, pop them in the chat box. I'm now going to stop sharing my screen and pass over to Sam to talk about tourism today. Um, okay, so um, my name's Samantha Dennis. I manage the Kingsbridge Tourist Information Centre, have done for the last 10 years now. Um, I'm also the tourism representative on the South Devon a and Partnership Committee. Um, my talk's going to be fairly brief because I'm pretty sure most of you will have come to listen to Holly and see those fantastic photographs. But I just wanted to discuss a little bit how holidays have changed, how they are changing, um, and particularly, you know, how they have changed this last year and uh, what I think will be the future of holidays. Um, so um, some things are fairly similar. The people that come down to the South Hams um, are, you know, in some ways very much the same. Um, it appeals to a broad range of people. If anything, um, you might find more multi-generational groups now. So um, you might I would often get asked questions in the information centre. Um, where can we go for a walk with a pram and a wheelchair? Um, so accessible holidays are a big thing. And one that the South Hams doesn't really cater very well for at the moment. Um, the, the other perhaps change is that coming on holiday to the South Hams isn't cheap. Um, my friends were, uh, last year, came down, um, booked a safari lodge which i'll show you a picture of later uh, in kingsbridge um self-catering so i've had to pay for all their food and ended up paying twice as much for that than they had planned to spend on an all-inclusive holiday to the caribbean so it obviously does attract a certain person who has a bit more money to spend um and and in a way that's a good thing because um, because they're willing to support the local shops, they're willing to buy local produce, and they're putting more money into the local economy. I'll come back to that later, but the, it works, plays to our advantage that those that come on holiday here often like to be seen to be local or to feel local. And the hospitality businesses around here will exploit that um, to their advantage I only need mention Sulcum as a brand and you'll get the general gist. There we go. Um, the majority of people that actually visit the area are probably friends, family, there's me and my family. Um, it probably us years ago used to come regularly and now have moved down here. So when we talk about tourists, we need to remember that a lot of them are related to us. They're here because we are here. Um, and they don't pose a threat in all instances. So in terms of activities, um, lots of them are very similar. Uh, walking, as Holly mentioned, um, sports, golf, sailing has always been a big attraction here. Obviously the beaches and the games you can play on the beaches. Um, but we've diversified stand up paddleboarding, paddleboard yoga, goat yoga. Um, anything that's kind of wellness orientated, to be honest, the wackier, the better. I once went to a press conference in London, sat down trying to sell the area and every single journalist that sat in front of me wanted to know what was new, what was different, what was just a bit off the wall. Um, Black Autumn Worm Charming event came up several times. <laughs> so events they're also quite similar holly showed you some wonderful pictures of regattas there obviously they still take place it, i might say that perhaps a bit less sailing goes on though um festivals such as the food and music festival um 
Kingsbridge celebrates Christmas, play a key part in punctuating the year and extending the season. I've really felt the lack of events this last 12 months and the next coming 12 months, I think will be interesting. Um, food. Um, I find the tourists I speak to tend to just travel from breakfast to lunch via a cream tea to dinner. Um, <laughs> foodie experiences is something that people travel for that they're willing to spend money on. I've got another picture of Silkham Gin here, um, so perhaps you can guess my favourite tipple. But, um, you know, this experience that Silkham Gin offers is not a cheap one, um, but it's, it's different, you know, and others have since copied this. The main thing that I think differs and will have a huge impact on tourism in this area as we go forward is the accommodation. So Holly touched on hotels and guest houses. Um, obviously hotels are still around and this is a picture of Gower Rock's secret suite. Um, they're on a different level to what they used to be. Um, you've only got to walk into the rooms at Burr Island Hotel and see how tiny they are to appreciate that people now expect a lot more space. Expectations have gone through the roof. Um, but you'd be hard pressed to find a guest house, a traditional bed and breakfast, and you definitely wouldn't find a hostel in the South Hams anymore. Um, this year has seen an increase in camping and glamping, um, but the there's an example of glamping. That's actually the safari lodge that I referred to earlier. Um, that's in the grounds of Lower Coombe Royal in Kingsbridge. Um, but the main accommodation now is self-catering. And I think my slides have gone a bit the wrong way around here. There we go. Um, so yes, yeah, so self-catering. There are literally thousands of self-catering properties in the South Hams. People often phone me up in the information centre and say, oh, I stayed in this one. It was down a little lane in South Pool, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, I'm sorry, but it could literally be hundreds, you know. Um, and I think that's what's different. Self-catering is great. It offers more flexibility for families. But the more self-catering houses and homes and apartments we have, the less residential properties we have. Um, and it's interesting who owns those self-catering properties um, and how they're managed. So a lot of the agencies, Coast and Country Cottages, or Holiday Home, Drew River Cottages, have in the past five or six years been bought out by national, if not international companies. The only remaining larger self-catering agency um, in Kings, well, in the South Hams, uh, and that run in the South Hams is total cottages. The rest are now managed elsewhere with, you know, sort of smaller offices and um, token staff, if I may say so, um, left in the South Hams. I'll come back to that point in a minute. Airbnb is the other major change in recent years. And I can see how it came about. When I started in the information centre 10 years ago, I would have a lot of people who wanted just to stay for one night somewhere. They were either walking the coast path, they were attending a wedding, a funeral, some other sort of event. And bed and breakfast weren't interested. You know, it wasn't worth their time for a one night stay. Um, but demand always wins out and the customer's always right. And so we have seen the rise of Airbnb and the demise of your traditional bed and breakfast. Um, they're great. They offer flexibility. The length of your average holiday now has reduced from, you know, two weeks, one week to, to a weekend. And, and a lot of people will only have one night available. They'll travel early in the morning and they'll travel late at night the following day. And hotels have got to become a bit more amenable to that going forward. So, um, that's all interesting. I just wanted to talk about a few changes that have concerned me, but equally interested me and so may interest you as well. Um, I talked earlier about this second homes and the, and therefore the sort of loss of residential homes. Um, 
the rise of Airbnb means that anyone with a spare room, why would they rent it out by the month when they could make £50 a night? It means that it's very difficult to accommodate seasonal workers now. And as I mentioned earlier, we've got these big national, international companies really dictating the majority of accommodation in the South Hounds. So that's a concern, um, but we've got to balance this economy, the economy with sustainability. Um, it's hugely important to the economy of the local area that we have tourism. We rely on that influx of visitors, but um, we've got to make sure that the area and the environment remains the same so that we, well, for many reasons, but you know, obviously we still need to be attractive. This last summer concerned me because um, although we were, you know, in a pandemic, it was incredibly busy. We, it was the rise of the staycation. Um, we had a lot of new businesses pop up, people clambering to convert their spare bedrooms into a holiday let, um, people buying paddle boards and hot tubs so they could rent them out. And while I admire this entrepreneurial spirit, here's just one example, and this is a good one, um, of a new business that started up. Um, I worry that they have not got the, they haven't lived in the area very long. They don't necessarily, um, haven't had time in their rush to set up and make money to appreciate the needs of the environment. So that's something that needs to be worked on. Um, Destination management in this county, let alone the South Hams, has not been great. While English Riviera has a massive budget for holidays, um, a marketing budget, we never really have, and that's probably a good thing. Um, but counties like Cornwall have a very joined up approach to how they manage their tourism, whereas Devon is very fragmented. We have Visit South Devon, we have Visit North Devon, visit East Devon, visit Dartmoor, um, probably none of which you've really heard of. There is a Visit Devon now, which has come about in the last few years to try and make an impact here. But this lack of management is worrying. The council stopped funding tourism a while ago. And while they facilitate it by providing public toilets and car parks, um, there isn't the money there to manage. So. People, I find now, act quite spontaneously when they're going on holiday. They don't really sit down and plan beforehand, and that's changed. They are very surprised when they get here and they encounter narrow lanes. Um, and um, as a result, they, they, they use the internet um, to get their information. I mean, I run an information centre and I will say that they probably only come to us now when they're desperate um, or then they want to buy a postcard, which they still do, Holly. Um, <laughs> but yeah, there's that kind of confusion about where the message comes, where the information comes from. So whilst I don't want to kind of end on a dampener, I just think it's quite interesting to think about what we like in a holiday, what appeals to us when we go away. Um, and how we can maybe manage this um, going forward. It's why I wanted to be the tourism representative for the AOMB, and it's why I'm still interested in managing the information centre 10 years later. Um, but yeah, I'm open to any questions. So thank you for listening to me.